Thank you. Please take your seats. Wow. Truly, isn't it? Wow. Oh, boy. Well, Pastor Phil and Pastor Chris, honestly, are two of the nicest church leaders that my wife Killy and I actually know. I mean, we travel the world, so we mingle with a lot of leaders, and some of them are full of, we won't say what. <laughs> but Pastor um, Phil and Chris are godly, they're gracious, they're generous, they're good. And it's a privilege for Killy and I uh, to be here and uh, to be part of this conference. I tell you, uh, when we did get invited to the conference, I, I'm always eager to know, you know, who's going to be teaching. Because I've heard myself. And, uh, I mean, I know what I'm going to say. And, um, and I've been deeply blessed. Last year, Killy and I, we went and had lunch uh, with Pastor Phil and Pastor Chris in their home. And uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Phil and I, we were playing backgammon. Now, I rarely lose at backgammon. I mean, I've even played a master at backgammon, and that's an incredible level to get to. And, and I beat the master 17-3, okay? Now, I'm playing Pastor Phil. I, c I just can't believe the dice he's getting. I was like, what's this? What's that? And then I realized halfway through, I'm playing against two people. I'm playing against him and the Lord. <laughs> I mean, talk about the Lord being on someone. And then he, he started telling me uh, about the dog. And I thought, oh, he's trying to distract me. But the parable of the dog was, was just incredible. I was so inspired as I heard that story that I, I said, Pastor Phil, you've got to write this down. You've got to write this down. So I, I seriously, I, I've read it in manuscript form. It's a fantastic, inspiring story. And I urge you and I encourage you to purchase that. And if you read his story and don't understand it, read my foreword. <laughs> And that will explain it all to you. <laughs> About a year ago, Pastor Phil, he rang me. And he, he's like, I get on the phone, and he's like, Jay, Jay. And, you know, <laughs> you've you, you got to come to Presence Conference. And it's difficult. You see, if he sends me an email, I can think about it. <laughs> but it's like, we're on the phone now. He wants an answer. <laughs> So he's like chatting, he wants an answer. Well, I, you know, I don't know if I'm free. So I've kind of got the phone on my ear like this and I'm holding it there and I'm walking to my study. I've got to get the diary out and I'm trying to look at the dates and he's talking to me and I'm trying to hear God. I'm trying to hear Phil. I've got the diary. I'm like trying to make a decision. I mean, pressure. Normally, though, some people who invite me, they say, oh, uh, could you please come uh, in May of next year? Are you free? And I say, yes, I am free, but I'm not coming. <laughs> but I tell you, in my heart, I was looking at that schedule, hoping that Killy and I were free, and we were free. We said we would love to come. I put the phone down. The moment I put the phone down, God told me the message that I'm about to give you now. Seriously, seriously. God gave it to me. I feel, I feel a bit like Mary, you know, when the angel spoke to her. And then you've been carrying this. <laughs> I've been carrying it for a whole year. I've, no, I've not preached it anywhere before, but God told me, and I, I sat down at my desk and I started jotting, and, and God told me that tonight, well, I didn't know it was going to be this night, but tonight, to remind 
all of you of four things. So the first thing I believe God wants to remind us is about the book. The book. The sacred book. Put your hand up if you've read the Bible from cover to cover. Okay? Okay, forget the index and the maps, you know. (laughs) Genesis to Revelation. All right, hands down. The rest of you, okay, chill out about it. Don't feel too guilty yet. (laughs) Listen, when you get to heaven, it's going to be a little bit awkward. Because you're going to get there, and Peter's going to go, welcome, we've been expecting you, come on in. Oh, let me introduce you to Obadiah. Obadiah says, did you like my book? (laughs) You go, book what book? (laughs) Who published it? (laughs) And then he introduces you to Zephaniah. Zephaniah says, did you like my book? What, you wrote a book as well? (laughs) Listen, you're not going to be able to have conversations with certain people. (laughs) I'd urge you and encourage you, don't put yourself in that situation. (laughs) Seriously. This is the only reliable data that we have about God. It is a sacred book. Do you know that in the Quran, do you know what Christians are called in the Quran? We Christians in the Quran are called people of the book. That's how we're called. We're, we're called people of this book. This book. When I was a student, I used to go to Quran studies. I used to go to Christian Union. And I used to go to Quran studies. And uh, there's a story behind that. But when we went to Quran studies, we used to have to wash our hands before we touched the Quran and opened the Quran and read it. One day, the president of the Islamic Society came to the Christian Union, and he saw me put the Bible on the floor. And he said, Jay, John. Why did you do that? And I'm like, do what? (laughs) Why did you put your holy Bible on the floor? And I was like, oh, it's only the Bible. (laughs) Do you know from that day since I've never put, I have never put my Bible on the floor. (laughs) This is the holy book. This is the only reliable data that we have about God. If your Bible is falling apart, then you won't be. It was said of John Newton, the guy who wrote Amazing Grace, that if you cut him open, the Bible would have fallen out of him because his blood was bibbling. Is your blood bibbling? We read the Bible. The Bible, we read the Bible to find. To find. The Bible lets us find our position and direction. Like a GPS technology, you can be told where you are and where you are going. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. People get a little bit confused about, oh, well, what's the Bible saying? Look, it's very easy. If the Bible says yes, it means yes. If the Bible says no, it means no. And if it doesn't say yes or no, God doesn't mind. (laughs) How difficult is that? We read the Bible to find. We read the Bible to filter. We all have antivirus software on our computers to avoid viruses infiltrating. We filter water. Now, there are some rapid poisons, but there are some slow-acting poisons which distort 
growth. Both need to be filtered out and not taken in. And the Bible enables us to filter the pollution of the world that we are constantly bombarded with. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We find, we filter, and it's a foundation. You know, we're surrounded by turbulent and corrosive sea of beliefs. And without foundations in place, we can drift, and we need an anchor. Though the cover is worn and the pages are torn, and though places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. This old book is my guide, tis a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find soothes and gladdens the mind as I read it and heed it each day. To this book I will cling, of its worth I will sing, though great losses and crosses be mine. For I cannot despair, though surrounded by care, while possessing this blessing divine. The book, the book, feed on the, feed on the word of God, feed on the word of God, read it, digest it, meditate on it. Now, when I, I'm not going to wait till the end of my, of my little teaching slot this evening to then say, hey, let's all respond. We're going to be responding as we're going to go through it. Okay? So here's the first opportunity. There's going to be four responses during the talk, and then there's going to be a final response for anyone who would like to receive Jesus. So in the four responses, you, some of you might have to respond four times. So I don't want you to feel, oh, I've done one. <laughs> okay, so this is the first one. The first one is in response to this. If you, listen, you know, you, a lot of people find this a dry book, but if you know the author, it can never be dry. Now, if you've lost your passion for the scriptures, if you've lost your discipline or don't have any kind of discipline for reading and feeding on the scriptures, if you would like to get a new sense of zeal and love and for the scriptures because you're lacking it, stand now. Lord Jesus Christ, we pray for every person who is standing now. You know by standing there saying, Lord, they, they want to value your word. They want to value your truth. So we pray now that by your spirit, you will burn in them a great fire, a great desire to get hold of your book, to make a choice, to be intentional in knowing how to read it, in knowing how to study it, in knowing how to meditate on it. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will inspire by them, you will guide them through your word as they feed on it daily. And we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Number one, the book. Number two, the breath of God. The book, the breath of God. Breath refers to the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. The Spirit is God's creative, revealing, and inspiring power. Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. 
John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who gives life. It is the Holy Spirit who empowers us. Zechariah 4 verse 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And last night was beautiful as we were just marinating in the presence of the Holy Spirit. There was a missionary society that had been in existence for 100 years, and they were having this major celebration to commemorate their 100 years in existence, okay? And they had this bishop to come and and pray a prayer, uh, thanking God for the 100 years. And they had 100 doves. And after the prayer, they were going to release all the doves as a symbolism of 100 years of, of functioning as a missionary ministry. And so what they did was they took one of the doves, they gave it to the bishop in his hands, and while he held it, he prayed, then he would release the dove, and then they'd release the other 99 doves. So he's holding the dove and he's going, thank you, Lord, for all these years. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we started in 1851. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we did this. Oh, Lord, we did that. Oh, Lord, we did this. And then he released it and it fell to the floor dead. (laughs) Stop looking back. Look back with gratitude. Look forward with a greater sense of zeal, a greater sense of expectancy. I love, I love Revelation 3, verse 20, where, where, where it has the imagery of Jesus knocking on the door of a house. If you hear the knock, open the door, let Jesus in. Come on in. I know we've probably, what, 99% of us here have done that. Come on in. But where's he gone? (laughs) You see, it's very easy to say, come on in, and then open a cupboard. Get in there. So you kind of say, he's in, he's in, where is he? (laughs) You know, interesting that the Bible says this, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not resist the Holy Spirit. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. There are three do nots with regard to the Spirit, the breath of God. Don't quench the breath of God. Don't resist the breath of God. Don't don't grieve the breath of God. So what we've got to do is say, come in. Take him down to the basement to clear out the the, the cobwebs. Take him to the attic to clear out the bats. Come into the sitting room. Come into the dining room. Come into this room. I want you in every area of my life. Have we, have we grieved the Holy Spirit by having him in our lives, but actually doing things he's told us not to do? Have we resisted the Holy Spirit? We know he's in our lives, but we've kind of like, ah, not here, not there. It's like, You know, have we grieved him? Have we resisted him? Have we quenched him? We've somehow ah, suffocated the breath of God. Do we need to open up our lives to more of his Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. His Spirit is holy. (laughs) Is there unholiness around, hovering around? Do we need to say, come, Jesus, come, Spirit of God, come, breath of God? If you know that tonight you need more of the breath of God, if you know that you have been quenching the Holy Spirit, you've been resisting the Holy Spirit, or you've been grieving the Holy Spirit, stand up now. 
We ask now, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. By standing, Lord God, we're saying, we are so sorry that we have grieved you and that we've grieved your spirit. We are so sorry that we have resisted your spirit. We are so sorry that we have quenched your Holy Spirit. Uh, but now we're saying, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Break us. Mold us. Fill us. Use us. Spirit of the living God. Do you remember that little chorus? Can we sing it? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on I me. <laughs> let's, spirit of, all right, let's do, let's go for the me one. Let's go for the me one. Right, take two. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Please be seated. Number one, this is what I heard after that phone call with Phil. I heard this, remind them about my book. Remind them, remind them about my breath. Thirdly, remind them about my blood. Without blood, there cannot be life in the physical body. The blood of Christ keeps the church alive and healthy. Jesus said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And in Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through the blood, the forgiveness of sins. The 22 sermons recorded in the book of Acts understood that the death of Jesus his death and the provision of the covering of the blood was the essential ingredient of the gospel. Christ's blood is perfect. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. O oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Christ's blood is precious. 1 Peter 1.19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Christ's blood is perpetual. The blood of the everlasting covenant, Hebrews 13, 20. Christ's blood is powerful. Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Christ's blood is permanent. 1 John 1, verse 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It is because of the blood of Jesus that we can be forgiven. It is because of the blood of Jesus that we can be healed. 
if you have any sense within you, if you are conscious of sin in your life, you need the cleansing of Jesus. If you need healing in your life, body, mind, spirit, you need the blood of Jesus. Because it's by his blood, by his stripes, we are healed. If you need cleansing or you need healing, stand up. Jesus, for every person standing now, we ask first of all, Lord Jesus, for each of us that are standing because we're conscious of sin in our lives, we're conscious that we've somehow, like King David, we've got ourselves dirty. And we're asking you, Lord Jesus, to cleanse us. Cleanse us because of your blood. Wash us clean. Make us as white as snow. And so, in Jesus Christ, I announce and I pronounce the forgiveness of your sins. Be cleansed. Be completely cleansed. Be completely set free. Washed. For each of us that's standing, because we have a health concern, we're asking now, Jesus, because of your blood, because by your stripes we've been healed, we are praying and we are reinforcing what Pastor Phil prayed last night. Lord, you're healing now. We speak it. Where there's been any kind of sickness, infection, disease in our bodies, we pray that by your blood, Jesus, you will wash it out of our systems now and you will set us free. We pray that where there has been any kind of degeneration, we pray now for regeneration, we pray for restoration in body, in mind and spirit, we pray for health and wholeness and well-being. Lord, may you just keep ministering your, your holy presence, your healing presence on us, in us, with us. And we pray that as we sleep tonight, you will minister healing to us and that we will awake tomorrow with a tangible sign of your healing at work. And we pray this in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Please be seated. Remind them of my book. Remind them of my breath. Remind them of my blood. Remind them of the bride. It was amazing. I can tell, it was like, it just burnt in me. I've never thought of that, those images before. I've never entertained them before. I've never, and it was like, whoa. The special relationship Jesus has with his church is seen in the terminology the Bible uses to refer to the church. The church is called the bride of Christ, and Christ is the bridegroom. We are the church. And one day, the church will meet her groom, Jesus Christ, the bride, the bride. He is preparing the bride. He's preparing the church. Now, if he came today, if he came tomorrow, what would, what would she be like? What would the bride be like? What would she be like when we misrepresent her? We say bad things about her. We don't respect her. We don't love her. We don't care for her. We don't speak well of her. 
We're not proud of her. What would she be like? Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without spot. She will be holy without blemish. Are we cleaning her? Are we cleaning the church? Are we preparing the bride to meet the bridegroom? Are we loving her? Do we love the church? Augustine said you cannot, you cannot have God as your father without having the church as your mother. He is preparing the bride. I love the church because Christ is the head of the church. Colossians 1 verse 18, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. Now some people say, I love Jesus, but I do not like the church. That is not possible. That would be like severing the head off. If we severed Bernie's head off, I don't think it would look good. (laughs) And there are people today who say, oh yeah, I I like Jesus, I don't like the church. Hebrews 10.25, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, not not this kind of, oh yeah, I I go to church, yeah, yeah, but you know, I like to have a bit of leisure as well, so I, I try and get there once a month. What's that? I mean, when people say that to me, it's like, I want to slap them. (laughs) What's that? (laughs) I love the church because the church is God's family. And however dysfunctional our family is, they are still our family. The giant redwood trees in the US have shallow roots. How then can they stay strong and not topple over without deep roots? It's because, and the reason is, the redwood trees are connected together by their roots. And since they are connected together at the roots, they are able to stand strong and withstand the storms of the wind. And as Christians, When we are rooted together in Christ, we are able to withstand difficulties because we are connected together. I love the church. And because I love the church, I will submit to the leaders of the church. Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. Because I love the church, I will work to advance the church. 
Matthew 16, verse 18, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon the rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Because I love the church, I will support the church. I will support the church prayerfully, I will support the church verbally, and I will support the church financially. Are we preparing the bride to meet the bridegroom? Bernie, thanks very much. Let's seek to be a humble church. One of the biggest obstacles to letting God's spirit blaze in the church is pride, and we need to have humility. Humility is to receive praise and to pass it on to God untouched. Let's be a humble church. Let us seek to be a holy church. To be holy means to be pure, no mixed motives, not contaminated by the world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. So let us be a humble church. Let us be a holy church. And let us be a heroic church. The great missionary William Carey said, his motto was, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. So let us be a humble church. Let us be a holy church. And let us be a heroic church. Revelation 19 verse seven, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Let us speak proudly about the bride. Let us speak positively about the bride. Let us not speak negatively. Let us not put her down. Let us not, you know, how, how would I feel if somebody spoke negatively about my wife? Don't you dare speak negatively about my wife. In the same way, let us stand for the church. Let us love the church. Let us be proud of the church. Let's serve the church. If you you have a tendency to put the church down, if you've had a tendency to be very negative about the church, if you've had a kind of a very, uh, almost like an un uncommitted commitment to the church, unreliable commitment to the church, but you're saying, hey, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to speak positively, and I want to be wholeheartedly committed to my church in every way, prayerfully, verbally, financially. I'm going to commit myself to serve the church, to prepare her for the bridegroom. If you've had a tendency to be negative in those areas, but now you want to be positive in those areas, please stand up now. Stand. Lord Jesus, we pray for every person here who's standing, who, and they're saying to you, Lord, that they want to be positive, and they want to be committed both to you and your church. And we pray, Lord, release them from the past and those things that have caused them to think things in a certain way. Just deliver them from that. And we pray, Lord God, that you will give them a great burden, a great passion, and a great compassion for the bride. And we pray for all of us, Lord God, that you will show us our part in how we can play our part to prepare the bride for your return. 
And we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. That is what the Lord has told me. It's a, it's a very simple message tonight. Be reminded about the book. Don't forget the breath of God. Cling to the blood of Christ that cleanses and heals. Embrace the bride, the book, the breath, the blood, the bride. These are non-negotiables. Non-negotiables. You may be here tonight, you've been invited by a friend, and uh, you're not, you wouldn't necessarily call yourself a Christian, you don't know whether you are, or maybe you used to be, but you found yourself here tonight, and you're maybe just during the singing and the worship, whoa, what, what's all that? Well, you know what it was all about? The worship and the music, tuning into the melody of heaven. That's what it was all about. You see, the word Christian has got the word Christ in it. If you remove the word Christ from the word Christian, you're left with I-A-N, Ian isn't gonna help you. Now, I'm sure Ian is a nice guy. <laughs> but he ain't going to help you. You know, the message of the Bible, there's 800,000 words in here. By the way, if you spent 15 minutes a day reading the Bible, you'd read through the whole Bible in one year. Just 15 minutes a day. I did it for 17 consecutive years. And then after 17 years, I changed my reading habits and I've done lots of different <laughs> things like that. But it was so good, because even in my early years as a Christian, I'd be in a, in a home group and, and somebody would say something and, oh, lamentation, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and you, you, you could notice the people who are looking at the index. And it's, it's all done very discreetly. <laughs> But do you, know, do you know what this book's about, really? It's about three things. Forgiveness from the past, new life here today, and a hope for the future. That's it. Forgiveness from the past, new life today, and a hope for the future. That's, that is what it's all about. And that's what the message of Easter is all about. And you and I, we can have forgiveness from the past, new life today, and a hope for the future. But if we want to have those things, we've got to go via King's Cross. <laughs> you can have it. But the only way you can have it is to go via the cross of the king. And if you're willing to go via the cross of the king, you will experience forgiveness from the past. Whoa! You will experience new life today. You know, not pie in the sky when you die, steak on a plate while you wait. <laughs> today, today, today. And then a hope for the future. A lot of people's hope is a bit like a hospital gown. You're usually not as well covered as you think you are. <laughs> 
Think of your life for a moment like a car, like a car. Okay, to be a Christian means Jesus is in the car of your life, to use that analogy. So listen, if you're not yet connected to Christ, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, or maybe you used to be, or you're half-hearted about it, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you, like I did with the previous four times, I'm going to ask you just to stand up in just a moment and say, hey, yes, I want to get that connection. I want to follow Jesus. I want Jesus in my life. Now, for 99% of us here, he's already in the car. But like the house, where is he? <laughs> Do you drive your car to church, unlock the boot, the trunk, get Jesus out for religious happy hour? <laughs> At the end of the service, get back in there. <laughs> And then, and then you, you go home. No one at home would know you're a Christian. You go to work. No one would know you're a Christian. You do it on a Sunday. And yet so you're going, no, Jay John, he's in the car. Oh, that's good. He's in the car. Where is he? On the back seat. A bit of a passenger. No, he's in the front. What? The front passenger seat. Still a passenger, bit of a companion. Now you're thinking one step ahead of me. You're thinking, I know where you're going, Jay John, with this analogy. You don't, actually. <laughs> but you're thinking he's now going to say, is Jesus in the driving seat? I am. <laughs> is Jesus in the driving seat of the car of your life? Now, everybody here who's thought, yes, he is, I have one more question for you. Are you a backseat driver? The car gets to an intersection. Jesus turns left. Where are you going? <laughs> I'm going down the road of generosity. Do you know in Britain, in Britain, the British think they're generous. They squeeze the pound so tightly, they make the Queen cry. The car gets to a roundabout. Jesus turns right. Where are you going? I'm going down the road of forgiveness. <laughs> I don't want a forgiver. <laughs> Did you ever see My Big Fat Greek Wedding, the movie? Yeah. Well, when that movie came out, because I'm Greek, my friend said to me, John, is, it, is, it, is that what Greek culture's like? I said, no, not at all. It's worse. <laughs> My mother is a travel agent for guilt trips. <laughs> if I want to feel guilty, just call my mum. <laughs> but you see, it's very easy to say, he's in the car, he's in the car, he's in the car. <laughs> Listen, some of you tonight you need to say, I want to get that connection. I want him in my life. Invite him into your life tonight. Others of you, you know he's in your life. You know that. But you need to reposition Jesus. Seriously do. You need to reposition him. You need to say, hey, Jesus, you know, I've realized I, you're in my life, but you're in the wrong place. I really want to put you in the driving seat of the car of my life. So listen, whether you need to do this for the first time, whether you need to reposition Jesus, please stand and we'll pray together. Stand now. Stand if that's you. Stand. Great. Great. Okay, those of you standing, just close your eyes. Don't worry about anyone else. I'm going to pray a prayer. I will pray this prayer phrase by phrase. So I will pray it once so you know the words. The second time I pray the prayer, can you please pray the prayer out loud with me? Those of you seated, you love Jesus, 
please pray the prayer with us as your way of reinforcing your own faith. Here's the prayer. Jesus, I bow before you now. Jesus, I bow before you now. I acknowledge you as my Lord and God. I acknowledge you as my Lord and God. I know I have done many things wrong. I know I have done many things wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse my life. Cleanse my life. I invite you into my life now. I invite you into my life now. Come into the driving seat of my life. Come into the driving seat of my life. Come in by your Holy Spirit. Come in by your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your peace and your presence. Fill me with your peace and your presence. Help me from this day on. Help me from this day on to fix my eyes on you. To fix my eyes on you. The author and the perfecter of my faith. The author and the perfecter of my faith. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Amen. A prayer for you before you sit down. In the name of Jesus Christ, I announce, I pronounce the forgiveness of your sins. May you know the truth and the reality of the prayer that you have prayed. May you know his peace and his presence. May all of us know his protection as we endeavor to fix our eyes on Jesus. And we pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please take your seats. The book, the breath, the blood, the bride. In the words of the prophet Nike, just do it. 